Belgium. Dr. Brian Holmes is known internationally for uh, the analysis of human language and cognition through the development of the relational frame theory and its application in various uh, psychological settings. He was the most uh, prolific, pro prolific author in the experimental analysis of human behavior for almost 20 years. So, Dr. Dermot, uh, welcome and uh, we are very glad and proud to receive you to this conference this morning. Um, thank you very much for uh, a very um, positive and flattering introduction and thank you to you and all of your colleagues here uh, for inviting us, uh, both myself and uh, my partner in life and partner in crime, uh, Ivan, who will be giving a lecture this afternoon. Um, uh, we've had a wonderful two days since we arrived in Brazil. Um, and in the city and we've been shown some lovely areas and some lovely, f eaten some lovely food, drunk some fantastic wine, so we've had a great time here. <laughs> so it's been a thoroughly enjoyable experience so far, so I hope our, our, our lectures and so on can live up to the welcome we've received. Um, I've long wanted to visit Brazil because I've had students come from Brazil for a number of years now, when we were based in Ireland and when we were, and since we moved to um, Ghent, in fact, only a few weeks ago, uh, a, a Brazilian couple were working in, with us in our lab. And uh, uh, so there's been a long connection there with, with Brazil um, for many years, um, but I never actually managed to get to Brazil, so this is a, a, a wonderful opportunity. I'm very pleased to be here and uh, uh, very pleasantly surprised. It's an absolutely beautiful country and a lovely people. You're all very warm and friendly and tolerate our inability to speak any Portuguese whatsoever, which is always welcome. Um, uh, having been raised and educated in England, of course, I have no other language other than English, but that's standard for English people. Um, in one way, um, I think I was probably the worst person, or one of the worst people in the world to ask to give this talk, um, because I've been working in relational frame theory for over 30 years now. Um, and so when somebody says, when you talk about relational frame theory, I say, well, I can, you know, I can do that forever, don't worry. You know, I've spent most of my career doing that. Um, but the same, when they say an introductory talk, I start to get anxious because it's very difficult sometimes when you've been doing something for that length of time to appreciate um, how complicated, how complex, or how foreign um, what I take for granted on a day-to-day -day basis is brand new for other people. So please do forgive me if um, you lose track of me. It's not you, it's me who's at fault, okay? Um, and with that in mind, I, I, I would like to try and make this as interactive as possible. So don't let me drone on. Um, if you don't follow what I'm saying, put a hand up, stop me, feel free to ask questions or clarification as I go. I, I would prefer that rather than you leave there and saying, well, it was nice to see that guy from Ireland, Belgium, <laughs> England, wherever he's from, but I didn't understand a word he said. And it had nothing to do with the fact that he spoke in English. Um, uh, so please, do feel free to stop me. I'm only too happy to, to clarify and for you to as we say in my area of psychology, to shape my behaviour up to make sure you get the most out of it. So, having said all that, uh, let me start by asking the people here, um, all of you, uh, how much you know or don't know so that I get an idea of how to proceed. First of all, can you put up your hand if you've heard of relational frame theory, just heard of it? You don't know a lot about it. Okay, that's not too bad. That's not too bad. Um, that's more than I thought. 
How many of you have heard of it but know virtually nothing about it? Okay, that's very honest of you. <laughs> okay, uh, so I, that's, the, that's useful. I've got a sense now for how to pitch this, which it uh, will be, um, I think, to the benefit of everyone. Okay, well, let me start, I suppose, uh, at the beginning. I'm going to attempt to give you an introduction, um, and that introduction will largely focus on um, what appears in this book. This is the seminal text on relational frame theory that was, uh, it, well, it's edited, it's edited, but it was basically more or less co-authored largely by myself and Stephen Hayes and Brian Roach with our students and colleagues at that time. But we sort of wrote every chapter um, along with um, or, or top chapters that had been written beforehand uh, and worked through them and more or less wrote them. So although it's an edited book, it reads more like an authored book if you're familiar with it. Which again may not have been a good idea because I've been working in relational frame theory for almost over 10 years at this stage. And so Steve and I probably wrote what some consider to be a fairly impenetrable text in places. So if you are starting afresh, um, don't buy this book. Um, <laughs> buy this one instead. Um, you can, you'll survive this one. It's written by Nicholas Tornake, and it's like a, um, uh, an introductory text that actually does introduce the, the, the theory rather than this one. This is also another good one. If you're interested in application or applied psychology or how relational frame theory and the study of what we call derived relations have been applied, this is another excellent book. This was uh, co-edited by um, Ruth Ann Rayfeld and uh, as in my partner in crime, Yvonne Barnes-Holmes. And it's really very much a, a focus on how you use what we talk about in RFT in applied settings, largely educational settings there. But again, I think it's a good introduction to uh, the concepts and, and uh, key issues in the area but very focused on application. So if you're more of an applied person rather than an experimental psychologist, that's a book I recommend. If you survive both of those and you want to go back for more, then I think this is probably the book to go for. So I probably just cost myself an awful lot of royalties, um, but so be it. It's better that you read it and understand RFT than you know, I get a check from Plenum every so often. Not that it's made me a lot of money, I hasten to add. You know, I would retire on the wealth of the book that I wrote here. I have to write some fiction for that. Anyway, so with that in mind, if you have tried to read the book and you found it difficult, don't worry, that's very, very normal. And uh, I'll try and uh, provide some sort of background to it now that will help you maybe understand where it came from. So, uh, I, 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 I thought about how to start this, and I thought rather than just jump into you know, the terms and concepts that we use in RFT, and that you may be familiar with, I'd try and provide some background to where it came from. And I mean historical background going way back to before psychology was even really a science. So, just give me a second here, I'm just going to get out of this and go to a, um, a separate file um, so that you can get a sense of what I'm talking about here. Okay. Um, so, before, again, before I start this, but how many of, how many people in the room have, are familiar with behavior analysis as an approach? Okay, so most okay, right. Again, that that that's useful. Um, so I want to start with trying to lay out what I consider to be the historical and intellectual roots of relational frame theory, so that you can understand more clearly 
what drives it and what has driven it as an approach to language and cognition. Now, I think historically the theory can be traced back to um, a line of thinking that um, this individual here uh, was responsible for. Does anybody recognize him? Yep, <coughs> Charles Darwin. Um, uh, and he and, of course, contemporaries of his uh, generation developed uh, the beginnings of the theory of evolution, which is you know, a theory of life. It's one of the most successful theories in science uh, and permeates most of the way in which modern uh, human sciences cast their ideas, theories, models, and so on to this day. Um, it's still controversial in some ways, but nonetheless, it changed the way in which um, science thought about life itself on this planet or trying to explain life. And by life, I mean the complexity of life. And the basic model that, that Darwin proposed was that one that was um, innovative, challenging, but also one that was intensely scientific in the Western sense of that word. He proposed a way of looking at trying to explain complexity in terms of selection. Selection by consequences. You produce some action, some behavior, some pattern. That pattern is either a good pattern to continue, it makes you fit with your environment well, or it's not so good. If it fits well, if it's successful in producing some outcome that helps you survive as an individual or as a species or at some level as a group, then that will survive to tell the tale. In other words, it will get passed on or attained in some way, and that either gets retained genetically, biologically, but it can also get retained culturally or through behavior, which is something that's only really been fully appreciated now. Early evolutionary science was very gene-oriented, but it's a far more sophisticated account that we deal with today, particularly with the rise of epigenetics, where environments can change individuals, turn genes on and off, which means that change can occur far more rapidly than even Darwin anticipated when he laid out the theory. But the core model that he proposed was um, one that I think underpins behavioral analysis as an approach to psychology and also one that underpins relational frame theory, which I hope you'll appreciate by the end of the talk. Now, Darwin proposed two things, one of which we assume was the one that people laughed at him for uh, and which he was derided for, and there were cartoons in the British press at the time and so on, was this idea that we evolved from lower animals, from apes. And there's that famous cartoon of Darwin with the, uh, with the body of an ape or the head of an ape or something like that anyway. But in fact, at the time, that, that proposal that humans evolved from primates um, and from lower animals, for want of better expression, was not that challenging in the scientific community. The scientific community were aware of that. Darwin, for example, is actually buried in Westminster Abbey in, in London. They knew when he died that he was something special. They've just literally buried or in, there will inter um, uh, Stephen Hawking's body in there, uh, alongside Newton and some other luminaries of British science throughout the um, uh, 19th and 20th century. So, in that sense, they, they didn't they didn't see Darwin as a as a crank or a madman. They they, they knew they had somebody very very special, and the work that he'd done was uh, uh, unique. By the time he died. What was exceptionally challenging for intellectuals of that time was the idea that you could explain life and complexity itself by focusing only on consequences. There was no grand design, there was no purpose, there was no magic, there was no animism, if you like, which is sort of a Christian idea, that you know, life didn't evolve because it was going in some preordained direction. Now, the personal side of Darwin's life was he was a, an agnostic, 
and his wife was a profoundly religious individual and they fought, fought tooth and nail over this throughout their married life apparently. They didn't divorce over anything like that but they didn't see eye to eye on this particular topic and some have said that uh, some of Darwin's stance on this was driven by the fact that one of his daughters, uh, a favourite of his, died when she was quite young and this robbed him, uh, robbed him at the time of his faith and so he gave up on on religion, but I, I, I personally I don't think that was a major factor in the theory. I think he was just playing the science game when he made those proposals. But it is a challenge still to this day, and academics today, including some very famous British ones again, like for example, um, uh, I'm having a senior moment, Richard Dawkins came back to me there, have made careers out of making this argument over and over again that you can explain complexity by focusing on evolutionary principles. So the challenge was, how can we explain, how do we explain things without appealing to purpose, without ex appealing to grand design, a direction that we're going in. And Darwin solved that problem by saying, we just look at what happens when something happens. And he looked at that the point of view of a characteristic of an animal or a behaviour of an animal that made it more um, uh, survive, uh, increased survival value, and then said, if that's the case, that will proliferate. That the characteristics of that animal, of that species, and so on, will get stronger, will emerge in the group, and then gradually across generations, particular characteristics get shaped up. Now that's a challenging concept for life itself, for even explaining how the length of a beak in a bird, uh, a species of bird, grows across time if it, if it helps it feed better, or the length of a giraffe's neck helps it you know, fight better with another giraffe for the opportunity to mate and so on, which is why giraffe's necks are so long apparently. It's not so much to do with being able to get stuff from trees, it's just that that's how male giraffes fight each other, they sort of bang necks together. It looks a bit bizarre when you see it, but apparently the longer the neck, the better the giraffe competes. <laughs> and of course, if they get too long, it makes it difficult to eat and drink and, and, and so on. So there's that constant tension, if you want to go there. But it's a remarkable insight. Now, the challenge becomes, how do you take that way of explaining things and apply it to the one area in which it just doesn't seem to work, or not readily, and to this day, the psychology that is attempted to use the selectionistic metaphor is still a minority position, because the dominant position is one in which purpose, um, a, a, a backward causality, is the norm. In cognitive psychology, the idea is that we represent the world in some way and we do things psychologically because we're trying to achieve some end. It is in one sense, and Skinner once said this, and I will come to Skinner in a minute, he's up there, said that cognitive psychology, and I'm not taking this position, I work in a department of cognitive psychology with cognitive colleagues and I enjoy working with them very much, but we do not share the same philosophical view. And that is that you can only understand psychology by assuming there is some purpose. You're doing things because you want to achieve them. There's some motivation to do them. In behavioral psychology, if you're familiar with behavior analysis, we can't do that. We have to look to the past. We have to explain complexity, psychological complexity, by appealing, what, by appealing to what happened before, not what is going to happen tomorrow. And that has been the challenge. It's easier to do it with rats and pigeons and non-humans, but when we focus the lens on us, it becomes a very difficult task indeed. And RFT is very much, relational frame theory, is very much an attempt in behavior analysis to do that, an ongoing challenge, which is underlies the theory itself, what drives us forward. Okay, so, as Charles Darwin, Who's this guy? Probably less, less, less well known here, perhaps. Okay, this is uh, Wittgenstein, who was a very famous philosopher, 
And why is he up there? He said, what's he got to do with psychology? He was a philosopher, and a pretty weird one too, and wrote, again, impenetrable texts called things like the Tractatus and so on. It's full of just one line or two line propositions, and scholars to this, to this day spend an enormous amount of time trying to understand what he wrote. Well, some folks in cognitive science claim Wittgenstein to be one of their own, and they often say, oh, Wittgensteinian, uh, our view is very much driven by the Tractatus and Wittgenstein. What they really mean is that their, their view, their philosophy of uh, the mind is very much driven by early Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein, as articulated in his first serious work, the Tractatus. However, Wittgenstein, I think, was one of those literal, literal ge a, a genius in many ways who suffered for his, uh, his intellectual ability because after writing the Tractatus, he said, that's it, I've no more to say on the issue. And he went off and became, um, I think, a school teacher for a while and then went off and worked as an orderly in a hospital and then went out in a boat into the Norwegian fjords and, and did a sort of a, a, a 40 days or 40 nights in the desert type thing where he uh, then came back and said, no, no, I, I take it back, I have more to say. Um, uh, and he went off and then wrote a, a text called Philosophical Investigations. He wrote quite a lot but didn't publish a great deal during his life. He, I think he didn't have time to publish in the days when academics were allowed to do that kind of thing. He was independently wealthy, by the way. He was a European aristocrat, or came from an aristocratic family. So why is he up there? Well, philosophical investigations is where he proposed the idea of language as a game. In the Tractatus, he proposed the language as a, as a, as a, a device for uh, capturing, picturing um, reality, if you like. In philosophical investigations, he lets go of that and he says, language, there can be no private language. The language is just a set of rules that we use to play a game to communicate with each other. This gets perilously close or very close to what Skinner lately, uh, less says lately, or says subsequently, about language being just a way of changing the behaviour of other individuals. So, that, But at the heart, then, of relational frame theory is the idea that language is a game. It's not a system for representing reality. It's not a system for capturing the world as it really is. It's a, a, a set of behaviours that occur that allow us to adapt to our social and physical worlds in increasingly successful ways. And what are those rules? Relational frame theory is about trying to work out what those rules are. Relational frame theory, if you like, is the science of trying to understand the language game as a game and not as a representational system uh, of, uh, of the human mind or understanding the human mind. Now, take those two traditions together and then you throw in the third man here, if you've got a, um, a, uh, any background in behavioural analysis, you should recognise immediately as B.F. Skinner, the founder of a, a minority area. People think of him as a behaviourist, and he was in many ways, but he was a minority behaviourism. Radical behaviourism is a minority position within what is considered behaviourism more generally. Um, and it is fundamentally different from other behaviorisms. Other behaviorisms are often uh, what I've described as associative. They're precursors maybe to cognitive tradition in which you explain things and with um, stimuli and responses that occur inside the head, Hullian behaviorism, Guthrie, Tolman, and so on. People who are considered to be behaviorists but weren't but radical behaviorists in the sense of Skinner. Now, why would I say that uh, Skinner's at the uh, one of the intellectual roots of RFT? Because sometimes in the literature, sometimes in the discourse that's occurred within behavior analysis, that there seemed to be this antagonism between relational frame theory and the Skinnerian account of language, as he wrote it in a famous 
or infamous text he wrote in 1957 called Verbal Behavior. And in one sense there is that, in the early days, and certainly I participated in those debates, this uh, tension between what Skinner had written and what um, what we later uh, in relational frame theory proposed. But really, honestly, I don't see much of a difference in myself um, and uh, uh, Yvonne and Veronica Cullen, and one of my mates, PhD students, wrote a, a paper in 2000 which attempted to bridge the gap between the two, which has been relatively widely cited, and you can see there my, our attempt to try and bring the two together. But I think intellectually the two sit side by side. All that relational frame theory is, it's a natural extension, a natu another attempt to try and develop a behavior analytic theory of language and cognition. Nothing more, nothing less than recognizing that science should never stand still. It should never ossify itself. It should never say, We've, that's it, that's the end of it, we know that, we'll put that book in a, a tabernacle and worship it as the holy text that it is, and never move on. That's a very bad place for science to go. And in case you think, uh, I've you know, so that's that's great for you to say, but what about RFT? That's all. You, you, you can't do the same thing there. I said, absolutely. And I've made myself a little unpopular with some of my relational frame theory colleagues in recent years by saying, let's not do the same thing again. And I have been have a, a, I might have it on one of my presentations, a, a picture of the RFT text inside a tabernacle, uh, a tabernacle with a priest worshipping it and saying, we don't want to do this. That's a very bad thing to do in science. Um, you should regularly burn your books. Not literally, not literally, but metaphorically. Burn your received wisdom, burn the books of your elders, even burn your own books. And I was introduced recently for a talk and someone said, this is 